Welcome back to the Dallas Prospect. I am DDP, and today we have much more uplifting news. The Mavericks obviously getting game two in the W column, in the win column, with a 119-110 victory, handing the Oklahoma City Thunder their first loss of this postseason. Not only that, as I said in my game one video, which actually published yesterday midday, uh, OKC had not allowed a single team to score more than 95 points yet in the postseason. I understand that means only two opponents, but still, a sample size of five games, they had not allowed anyone to score 95 plus. 96 plus, because the Mavericks had 95 in game one. I digress! The Mavericks get the job done, and not necessarily for the reasons you might have thought. Because Luca started out a house of fire in the first quarter. He looked good, moving well, uh, getting into the paint, finding his shots, hitting four threes. Luca ends up with like 16 points in the first quarter. Dallas as a team is cooking. They're, they're midway through the second quarter, and they're like 8 of 13 from three. And it's a double-digit lead. But it wasn't a comfortable lead. Because OKC shot like 12 of like their, I'm trying to remember. It was like 12 of their first 20 or 25 shots were right within the paint, like within 10 feet, certainly. And that just isn't a good recipe for Dallas because while on one hand, yes, hey, great, you're shooting 8 of 13 from 3. The problem is can you keep that up? Is it just a hot start, or is that going to be your game? Now, Dallas did end up shooting almost 50% from three for the game, so largely right there, held right about in, in line with that. That's great. What had to change for Dallas was the interior defense, and it did because, yes, Luka might not have had as good of a second or third quarter. Luka ended up with 29 10 and 7 in this game but again after 16 in the first frame you're thinking dude he's on his way to a 40 point gym no he still sub 30 points and his shot did cool off now he still ended up 11 of 21 from the uh from the field for the game compare that to his six of 19 in game one five of eight from three that was huge he was one of eight from three in the first game and there's some reason for concern but where he was better was his mobility his picking his spots, you know, setting the tone early. We know Luca loves to do that, but he, he did a better job picking his spots here. He also got some great defense. Not only does he get a block, he blocks a Chet Holmgren corner three. You block seven foot three Chet shooting a three? Good God, man. And it's not a strip like the Dirk slap down we saw for years. Like, no, he got up to block that shot. Just a thing of beauty. And he chipped in three steals. Now, I know he averaged almost two per game in the regular season, but these were very good anticipation steals, not just getting a hand in the passing lane. This was anticipating, uh, intercepting, just a great, great feel for it. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't, speaking to the, the point of defense, you might be thinking like, oh, what did his co-star do? What did Kyrie Irving do? Because we've been talking about, hey, Kyrie needs to have the ball in his hands a little bit more, especially if Luke is hampered. He needs to be running the offense a little more, controlling the pace of the game. I would argue Kyrie did all of that. All of that, except what you might have naturally assumed, and that being points. Kyrie Irving only took eight shots in this game and was two of eight. He finished with nine points. You might hear that and say, wait, 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 wait. Kyrie Irving put up a single-digit game in the playoffs, and you won on the road against the postseason unbeaten team, number one seed Thunder? What? That's true, man. Kyrie Irving, he was the floor general last night. Did a great job controlling the pace, setting the tone defensively, taking up for his team. Luka continuing to bicker with fans uh, courtside there at the game. And Kyrie, we saw it in game one too, but you saw it again here in this. And it might have even been the same fan with just season tickets or something. But 
getting in there and kind of taking up for Luca, taking that heat and just like, look, dude, we don't got time for this. I'm going to make sure my guy knows I got his back and we're going to, we're going to handle our business. You don't want to give Luca or Kyrie motivation, by the way. So if you're a fan, that's a very poor, very poor job of scouting your opponents beforehand. Cause that's the last two people you want to, you want to go the warriors route from the West finals a few years ago where you're like, Luca gets knocked down. You're like, Oh goodness me, helping him up by the hand. Even Draymond, who has you know the worst reputation for playing dirty and cheap shots? Even he was like rushing to Luca if he fell down. Like, oh goodness, here, help help you up here. Are you okay? You're having a great game, by the way. Good job. Anything to keep him from going into seek and destroy mode. This fan didn't really get that, and maybe that's part of why we get a near Luca triple double, 29, 10, and seven. But Kyrie's defense, good lord, Kyrie Irving got you two blocks, and he got you two steals. But I guarantee you, he deflected several more passes. It felt like four or five times he was stripping a dude who was either getting by him or gathering to go up for like a layup in the paint. Like, well, of course, where else would you take a layup from? But Kyrie's hands and his pacing and his sense of calm and confidence was so huge. And, you know, he only had two turnovers for the game as well. So everything you saw out of him, fantastic. Now, would I love more points? Of course. But again, you win by nine points in a very difficult environment in which your secondary star had single digit points. And Kyrie never pressed. There was only one time where I saw him maybe try to do something in the last few minutes of the game where I was like, ah, oh, he's gonna try and finally get going. Mm, no, he doesn't have a rhythm though, because he hasn't done anything in so long. And then he just didn't do anything again. So it was like, ah. But his rebounding, Kyrie Irving, man, 11 assists, that was huge. You might look at it and say, like, oh, well, he only had three rebounds. I swear two of those three were huge. Like, an offensive rebound in the closing minute when the game still isn't quite decided. Just a way of further driving that dagger into Oklahoma City's heart. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. And his vision, his passing, the way he got his teammates involved, fantastic stuff. Now let's talk about the co-leading scorer of this game. P.J. Washington stood on his business, a career playoff high, 29 points. Also chipped in 11 rebounds, 4 assists, 11 of 18 from the field, including a good God 7 of 11 from those corners. Now, he does end up fouling out in the final couple minutes of this game. I thought it was a very wishy-washy final foul. I thought Kid should have challenged that like he had had a successful challenge earlier on in the game. But I digress. P.J. Washington, man, he was huge. He had four threes in the first half, knocks in three more in that second half, particularly the fourth quarter. Just doing great, great things for Dallas. And that's the thing. I, I talked about it. OKC's game plan was we're going to crowd the hell out of the paint to make it harder for Luka to breathe and operate. We're going to collapse down so that they can't get those lobs to lively into Gafford. And we're just going to dare those role play shooters to beat us from three. We're going to intentionally leave Washington, leave Green, leave Hardaway open. Not so much Hardaway. Hardaway is the one guy that guys, teams usually give a little bit more attention to. But they were going to definitely try to say, yo, you got to beat us with the role players or we're not going to work. We're not going to sweat it. We will take and pay that tax where we have to because we know in the long run we're going to win with this strategy. Well, you couldn't win last night. Because P.J. Washington stood on business. And then, I already mentioned him earlier, you finally got the, the vaunted Tim Hardaway Jr. burner game. It finally showed up. I swear it's like the third good game he's had since the All-Star break. Tim Hardaway Jr. scores 17 points in 19 minutes. 6 of 10 from the field. 2 of 4 from 3, including... Not just, a, not just an and one three. There was another time where he almost got an and one three, still drew the foul, made all three free throws, or three out of four free throws, I guess. But just a great job there. At one point in that third quarter, OKC had pulled right back into it. It had gotten, I think they were even, either even or up one. And Tim Hardaway Jr. Uh, goes on like a personal 10-0 run. And it was just like, oh, wow, okay. And then he's who stuck the, the real dagger with like, 343-ish left. You have a broken play where the shot clock's winding down. Dallas 
kind of fumbles the ball under the basket, kicks it out to Hardaway. Lou Dort has a brain fart, and despite the shot clock, leaves Hardaway in the corner, like flocks to, I think it was maybe Luca at the, the free throw line extended, and just leaves Hardaway wide open in the corner with like one second on the shot clock, and Hardaway just knocks down the three. I mean, just utter, utter bonkers play like that, but that that really felt like that was the dagger of the game. Okay, see, so you know, played around a little bit more, but that, that was effectively it. So kudos to Hardaway. I've said this before, I'll say it again. If you got Hardaway on a burner, you damn well better win that game because those are precious. They are such a rare commodity. Countries could go to war over the, the limited quantity of Tim Hardaway Jr. burner games sometimes, particularly the second half of this season. They stood on business. I, that's just become the theme of this postseason for me for the Mavericks, standing on their business. But Hardaway, fantastic. And they needed every bit of what he could give them. It wasn't all good, though, for the role players. For instance, Gafford, he had 13 and 7. He was 4 of 6 from the field. Only 5 of 9 at the foul line. He had a block. He had a steal. But he was a minus 8 overall in 27 minutes. There were several plays in this game. And I know he's favoring that arm. It looks like it's the right arm, too, which is no good. But there were several plays in this game where he just didn't seem quite on the right, like, page. The same page as his teammates. Uh, he had three turnovers. One of which was a terrible pass that he forced and was telegraphed easily by, I think, Aaron Wiggins. And led to a thunder fast break the other way. He was in the middle of all that. He's missing free throws when he's getting to the line or at least missing too many of them. And there were two times in the in the fourth quarter where both Derek Jones Jr. and Gafford were going up to catch an alley-oop at the same time, or Jones Jr. driving to the basket, and I think the other time might have been Lively, actually, moving into the path, and they're just colliding. And it was like, what is happening here? How, do, how does that happen? Yeah, how do you have two guys go up for the alley-oop and no one comes away with it instead? Now, that doesn't matter because it's in, like, the final minute or so of the game and it's already basically decided. But j just a strange play there. And then you had Lively, who had a horrible game, frankly. I mean, now, defensively, the effort was there. He had a block. Uh, he, he played some good defense. But offensively, my goodness, he looked like a deer in the headlights. In 20 minutes, he has two points, four boards, and an assist, only one of seven from the field. And I swear at least three of those were chippies at the rim where he should have been throwing it down or at the very least softly laying it up. When he started seeing how in those last few attempts he was missing, that he was just flinging the ball at the board, it just looked like a player that was playing so fast and so uh, tense that he, it just, he had no control. He was just cycling out of control. And you had those moments where he's running into teammates and things like that. So, yeah, that play I was thinking of was a lively Derek Jones Jr. one. But I think he had a play later on where it was Gafford and Jones Jr. going up to try and catch the same alley -oop, colliding, and it was just a mess. So just a really weird, not good game from those two players there. Gafford, eh, I didn't love it, but, you know, he, he was gritty. He was the better of the two centers last night for sure. And, uh... You know, I I said before that Josh Green, he was ho-hum for me in the first game. I still felt like his three-point shooting was leaving a lot to be desired. But you know what? He had a big play late in the third quarter. Or no, it was late in the second quarter, right before the half. Dallas had like a six-point lead at the half. And he gets an offensive rebound on a play that looks like it's going dead in the water. And then splashes a three at basically, basically the buzzer there. To give Dallas its like six point edge, I want to say it was going into the half. Overall, Green in 16 minutes at 11 points, four of six from the field, three of five from downtown. So Green actually did a lot. He was a plus nine, and he only had one foul too. So he did a good job being disciplined and not getting himself into trouble. So I, I might not have been impressed by your 11 points in the first game, but you did a much better job here. And I think that I would be remiss if I did not give you credit and props for what you did. As uh, Nick Engstad points out earlier, cycling back to Tim Hardaway here, what I really loved about Hardaway was it wasn't just threes. We know 
that he gets on a burn, he gets a burn notice and he's just going to go. All he sees is the rim. His own teammates hardly exist. Cause you had that moment at the, I think end of the third quarter where he, he leaves a wide open Derek Jones Jr. In the corner uh, for a three point attempt instead trying to take a pull up jumper that falls well short, even if the ball's not, um, even if the shot's not defended, he, he's clanking it off like the front of the rim uh, on his pull up. It's a tough shot and he misses it by a, a considerable mile maybe miles harsh, but misses it quite a bit. And people are like, ah, dude, what are you doing right there? One more kick pass. And you had a much better look for a wide open shot for Derek Jones Jr. And it's like, Hardaway's got the burn notice, man. He he doesn't, his own teammates don't exist right now. And once the ball is in his hands, he's got it. But he was hitting a little bit of everything. He did hit a pull up mid-range jumper. He did toss a, uh, on a drive, a lob to Lively, Lively's only basket. Uh, he had a drive and finish over Chet. Like he was getting and scoring at all levels. So really, really love the balance from Hardaway there. Getting to the line, making, again, I think he was three or four at the line, but converting at the line, like just a great, great job. Like I said, he got fouled on a three earlier. And when he got the and one three, he missed that free throw is what it was. But just fantastic stuff there from him. Let's see. So PJ Washington had 19 at the half, was actually outscoring Luca for a moment. So that, that was pretty insane. But I'm trying to just look through any other key points here. Overall, both teams shot 47% from the field. Dallas, however, shot 49% from three compared to the Thunder, who cooled off considerably, going 10 of 30 from beyond the arc. Free throws actually went Dallas's way. The Thunder were 16 of 17. I think it was Chet who missed uh, 16 of 17, though. Dallas was 17 of 24. So the Thunder, much better percentage, but Dallas made as many as the Thunder even attempted, which is usually a good recipe there. And both teams, man, just protected the hell out of the ball. Only 10 turnovers per team for the game. That was that was really impressive. Uh, great job taking care of the ball. Mavericks won the, the assist battle 20 or 35, excuse me, 30 to 25. They do win the rebounding battle. That's good. Uh, they got beat pretty soundly in game one there. It's, it's a narrow margin here, 44 to 41. But they do win the offensive glass, 12 to 8. The two teams pushed at six blocks apiece. And Dallas had eight steals compared to five for the Thunder. So a lot of great stuff here. Where this game got concerning to me in this first half. Now it got concerning in the third quarter too. But at one point when Dallas has this lead... This was a game of runs. It really was. Dallas built up a lead. OKC went on a run, and we got like within three points, I want to say. And it was kind of like, oh, man, Dallas has shot the lights out. And yet OKC, in just a matter of minutes, walked it all the way back in to basically, you know, tied up again. And then Dallas had a run of their own. They responded well and pushed the lead back to 52 to 39. And it was just like, OK, well. This is going to be what this series is then, huh? A matter of a battle of runs between the two teams. Both of them are going to extend their lead and they're going to push. They're going to go on these runs where they're either closing the gap or they're pulling ahead. And it's just how can the other team respond? All of that. All of that's going to make this a very nail biting series, even though both games have been essentially double digit games. I think it was like 11 and nine points now, respectively. But these two teams are incredibly evenly matched. I could see this being a five-game series either direction, but every one of those games feeling like the, the losing team is coming out saying, we could have won that. Make this play better here. Avoid that turnover there. We could have won this game. And that's just, that's just the nature of the beast. I, I think these teams are where I still think the Thunder have the advantage. They're younger. They're deeper and more balanced. So that's two reasons. They're healthier. Luca's still playing beat up. You can tell he's beat up. He's hampered. Uh, Gafford has a hand or arm issue going on now that he continued to favor throughout the, the second half. Um, you just have a lot of guys, it feels like, banged up. Derek Jones Jr. has me concerned regularly about how banged up he is. Luca, man, I understand that like Luca's a guy that plays physical and guys are going to be rough with him, but the number of times he is seemingly incidentally hitting the deck because he's being dragged to the ground by Dort as he's flopping or he's being uh, having his heel stepped on in transition, running a break and he comes up hobbling 
like just all these little things happening it's kind of like at some point you're like it's always luca this happens to this is this isn't a coincidence here this this feels almost like a subtle subtle roughing up of the star player here so i don't know what to make of that but it is infuriating at times watching the game because i know both teams both fan bases feel like the others star players get away with every flop in the book but i think it's objective uh, objectively the case that both of these guys have somewhat hardened esque tendencies with the whistles they can draw but shea is way better at it and that's both a compliment and an insult i guess um a compliment in that he's better at it um and if you're both going to partake in it you might as well be the better of the two at it but in the case of you know being able to shamelessly do it or whatever then it's like ah it's not really something you want to do like if you want to be taken as seriously but of course shay doesn't have the same reputation i guess with it for whatever reason so yeah it, it really is it really is uh interesting seeing the whistles he'll get sometimes and even other guys on the thunder too but especially uh sga compared to like luca and what he's able to get compared to the role players for sure dallas feels like at times they're getting roughed up and then on the other end you got situations where like Luca's trying to go set a screen and Lou Dort grabs onto him, pulls him into him, and the the broadcasters, uh, he'd be brown and whatnot, are like, oh, that's an absolutely Doncic initiates that contact. That's an offensive foul. And everyone's like, but everyone outside of OKC fans is like, no, Dort grabs him. He's impeding Luca's path, grabbing him and pulling him down into him. That's a foul on Dort, which was correctly called, thankfully. Uh, you have other times where Dort, despite being built like a linebacker, is flailing and wrapping around screens as if he just got hit by a sledgehammer. And thankfully, that was a no call. But there are just times where it's shameless, where I'm like, man, you're a really, really, really good defender. And you have a physicality to your defense that not many guys in the league can match. It's weird the number of times you're you're flopping. And I, in, the, in the handful of Thunder games I've seen over the course of the year, I've not seen him do a whole lot of that. And so I almost wonder if it's like a strategic thing of like, he knows that like, oh, well, his reputation is that it's this. So if the ref sees him flying, he's going to assume something happened. And because Luke is also a bigger guy too. So he's just going to assume that something happened there. And maybe that's what he's going for. But so far, thankfully, it hasn't come back to bite them. But that is something I'm kind of keeping my eye on. Either they're seeing him flopping and they know it's foolish and so they're just not going to bite on it now uh, and he'll be forced to stop that. Or it's eventually going to start tricking them. And that's that's where it gets concerning. So, yeah, a lot, a lot to like from this game. Some things to still be very concerned with. OKC's health, youth, depth, and overall just their their coaching, I feel like. Dagonal is, I mean, he's coach of the year for a reason. I am still quite concerned about this. This is a battle of adjustments from game to game. I felt like OKC tried to do a lot of what they did in game one. And it was kind of like, look, we're going to keep doing this until you stop us. And Dallas did do some things that actually stopped them. Most of which was just the one thing that OKC was willing to concede and risk paid off. Those role players stepped up, hit those shots because you got 29 out of, P.J. Washington, because you got 17 out of Hardaway, including 10 in a row in the third quarter. And, uh, and to a lesser extent, 11 out of Josh Green. You were able to have a Kyrie single-digit game and still get the win. Again, that's just remarkable, but like that's that's the simple truth of it. So when you have that, when you're looking at that, it, it really does kind of make you say, like, okay, how much of this was adjustments versus how much of this was just, um, you know, things working out differently from game one. That'll be interesting to see. I'll, I'll be really curious to see how these two teams respond in game three in Dallas at the double AC. When OKC was going on that run in the third quarter, I was a little concerned for a moment that it was going to whittle away before Hardaway started doing his Hardaway burner thing. Because you had a moment where the Thunder are going on the run, and Kidd is just not blowing his – he's not calling a timeout. He's not – I was going to say blowing his whistle, but he's not calling a timeout. He's not stopping this tidal wave of momentum cutting back the other way. And every time you're looking at this thinking like, okay, man, 
Like we, we need something here. We need, we need to calm things down and kids just kind of watching it. And the thunder again, whittled it all the way back. Uh, and then Hardaway goes on his run and all of a sudden we're back to like an eight point game, at least with four minutes left in the third quarter. So great that Hardaway was there, but it almost felt like had Hardaway not started cooking out of nowhere, that kid was really running a risk here. One thing Dallas did, and I, and I should have mentioned this earlier when I was talking about P.J. Washington, one adjustment they made that I loved, working P.J. Washington in the post when he was guarded by SGA, I really liked what that opened up for the Dallas offense. SGA, he's a good defender, not a great defender, and in that position, he's you know he's not as strong. So P.J. has enough of a size and strength advantage that he's able just to muscle him in, and he gets a, an and one at one point, misses the free throw, of course, because he's not a strong free throw shooter, but draws an and one off of SGA, uh, where he's just backing him down, and you can tell SGA is just like, oh, crap, I'm falling back. I'm getting pushed into the basket. Let me just grab him and try and pull him away. But even on that, because he's falling back, he can't really pull PJ off his center of gravity, and so PJ just finishes the bucket. And I mean, just that that's it leading to a direct score. But you have other moments, too, where it's just opening up action at the Thunder having to kind of now roll the defense that way, help off of that, and it's allowing passes to open up other things for them. I liked that action, and that did feel like a legitimate assessment of seeing where, like, okay, uh, let's see how they contend with this. Oh, they're not handling this well. All right, let's go back to that action a little bit. I'll be curious how much they keep trying to utilize that action. Obviously, OKC is going to try and protect against it. But it was it was a unique thing for the Mavericks that I, I saw that I was like, I've not seen them do that much, but that is an advantage. And kudos to you for A, thinking of it, and then B, delivering on it. Let's see, let's see. I'm just looking through my final notes here as I get ready to wrap up this video. There was a, a lovely rendition of Luca Sucks chance from the, the Thunder crowd. I get why Luca would be so polarizing to opposing fan bases because every dead ball he will go and talk to the officials, whether he's demonstratively dressing them down for missing something. And don't be wrong, there were several plays they missed in this game. Uh, one moment, I think in the third quarter, where he goes to the basket, gets hit, flips the ball up, but they don't call the foul, so it's a missed shot going the other way. OKC turns the ball over in transition, and Luka had stopped or at least slowed to continue barking at the ref. And then when he sees the fast break coming the other way, they flip the ball up ahead to him. Luka gathers it, draws it in with um, a gather step right before Chet can get there to block it, gets hit again, and still doesn't get the call. And now he's looking at the ref, and he's just like, Dude, that's two in a row. And at least I made that one, but that's two in a row. I get it. But at the same time, it's like, if you're impartial and you're watching those plays, you're like, I know there's times you argue where you don't have a very good case. But those were not such a case. Like, you, you had a case on both of those. There's another moment where Derek Jones Jr. Uh, connects on an alley-oop with Luca. And Jones Jr. gets whacked in the head by Chet trying to block the shot from behind. And that's not called as a foul. And Luca again, looks to the ref and he's like, dude, what, what are we doing here? Like the physicality OKC plays with, Dort especially, Wiggins, uh, not Wiggins, uh, Jalen Williams, J-Dub as well. The physicality they play with, how it doesn't work both ways. And it feels like at times if you touch these guys at all or you're in their zip code that it's going to be a whistle that's that's got to be frustrating especially when some of your guys who are struggling to draw a foul at times is Luca, is Kyrie as well but like that's where it's a very valid concern of like huh I don't know what to what to make of that it, it makes it feel different but from a Thunder fan perspective because I have lurked in that Twitter space a little bit uh since last night <laughs> they're they're looking at it as like oh yeah Luca complains too much and they think overall 
that the whistles have favored Dallas. And I, I understand every team's got their bias and the, their fan base, I should say, has their bias. But it really is remarkable to me how, like, game one, Thunder fans are like, oh, that was properly officiated, and so the better team stood out. And then they lose game two, which was officiated, I feel like, much the same, but because Dallas' shooters connected and Dallas won, well, now they're bad referees. Now Scott Foster has a problem. Don't be wrong. I'm not a fan of Scott Foster. There are some head-scratching challenges here uh, and, and decisions in this, too. Like, at one point, Derek Jones Jr. is called for a foul on SGA driving the basket, but SGA throws out a forearm to the chin of DJJ, and they call it technical on Shea, but they also called the foul first on Derek Jones Jr. And so Jones Jr. goes, or Dallas goes and shoots a free throw, and then it goes back the other way for SGA to shoot his free throws. And it's like, what? That, that, that's confusing. Or another time where I think it was P.J. Washington got a backside block. Would have been his fifth foul of the game. OKC challenges, and, or Dallas challenges, excuse me. He does get him on the arm, but he gets the ball first. He gets the ball, and then the follow-through seems to be what gets the arm. Thunder fans up in arms about that. Um, and Maverick fans are kind of like, all right, well, that one that one works. That's, that makes sense, I guess. But it's just like the application of certain rules in an inst- like from a moment-to-moment standpoint is not consistent. Like they will issue a challenge or they will do a very, very similar situation will unfold moments apart. One instance, it's called one way. The next instance, a different official will call it differently or whatever. It's just, there's no consistency. It, it's always open to ever revolving interpretation and judgment. And there's not really discipline for when it's wrong, when it's just outright missed. So I don't know what the answer is there, but it, it was it was an interestingly officiated game, but I kind of felt that way about game one too. So I, I don't hold much of a, an opinion on that uh, other than to say like, all right, well, you went into OKC and you got the split that you needed. So let's see how Dallas responds on home court now. This comes from Panda Hank on Twitter. He says, PJ Washington in game twos. Granted, it's a two game sample size 23 and a half points, eight and a half rebounds, two assists, one and a half steals, one and a half blocks, 57% from the field, 67% from three. Again, it's a two game sample size. So be fair. Be fair. But that that is to keep using that phrase for him standing on business. Uh, Luca, after the game, talking about the crowd in OKC, he said, it's great for me. I love it. It was just, he's talking about the incident with the fan. It was just one guy on the court side going at my family. I don't like that. A grown-ass man going at my family. I didn't do anything, but a grown-ass man going at my family, that's kind of nuts. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, it's weird to me how fans will look at, um, and by the way, I don't know if I could ever hit that pitch again intentionally. It's kind of crazy to me how... People will, like, fan bases will be like, ah, these athletes, they are so soft, so weak, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, yeah, it, it is like harassment. And you put any of these people in there, in that athlete situation, especially in that kind of environment, they're not going to have the same standpoint. Just because guys in the 80s and 90s uh, and all that dealt with worse or that same treatment, at least, doesn't mean that it was okay or that it should be condoned. If, if, if that fan was doing that in Dallas courtside, but at a Thunder player, SGA just had his first daughter, I think, as well this year and got married. So it's like, if that was happening at a Thunder player from one of our fans, I would still be like, dude, what are you doing? That's weak. Like, don't don't represent us. I, I felt that way two years ago when you had whatever the debacle was with Chris Paul and uh, the teenage Mavericks fan that was supposedly harassing his family, like his mother and wife and all of that. Like, Even though that seemed in the end like it wasn't everything that it was initially stated to be, I still was like, what are you doing? Like, even if you know who they are, who cares? Why why are you trash talking them for their husband? They have nothing to do with this. They're associated with that person. That's it. I didn't like it then. I don't like it here. So it's not just a a Dallas bias thing. I I don't want that. I don't want that from any fans. 
I understand that it's there and that you're not going to like root it out of society or anything like that. But to me, it's weak, no matter who it's coming from. This was cool from a uh, block senior on Twitter. He says, let me get this straight. We won a playoff game in which Kyrie was check notes. Our sixth leading scorer. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's one of those things that the more you say it, the better it sounds like the more remarkable hard to believe in everything it is but it also makes it that much cooler that you got one of those especially again that that environment that opponent fantastic stuff mark followwell says can't say enough about the contributions of tim hardaway jr 17 points and josh green 11 points hardaway scored 10 straight in the third quarter those 10 plus of green three provided all of the points on a key 13 to 2 run with luca on the bench i didn't even mention that yeah that run we've talked in the past even much of this year if luca was on the bench it was not a it was not a plus minus for the maverick so all these reports these bs reports of like a veteran assistant coach says he believes maverick players are relieved when luca goes to the bench yes garbage all narrative all narrative either the report is taken out of context just based on like his complete uninformed conjecture or it's just the latest smear campaign against luca and it sucks because these things stick so when you have major outlets like bleacher reporter whoever talking about this stuff then it just gives life to this because it at least puts that thought in people's mind like oh an anonymous veteran coach oh he must know what he's talking about no he doesn't and you even had before the game, Marquise Morris on Twitter, like, dude, that's garbage. We love playing with Luca. PJ Washington out of the game. No, nah, man, I love playing with Luca. Luca being on the bench is never a plus for the Mavericks. In this game, they had a key 13 2 run that actually allowed Luca to rest a little bit, which was key because we've been running his ass into the ground and he still played 41 minutes here. So getting him to sit for 4 19 in the third quarter, again, 48 minutes in a game. He sat for over half of that in the third quarter, and the Mavericks actually won that period by double digits, all because of a Hardaway burner and a timely Josh Green three. Yeah, certainly not, not, not how you're constructed to do it, not something that can be replicated frequently, but good if you got it. Let's see, the Mavericks um, broke even with the OKC bench, scoring 30 apiece, so both benches contributing 30 points. Now, to be fair, uh, the last two points, he says, this is follow well still, uh, came from Wiggins were due to a foul taken by Exum to get Kyrie out of the game. So really Dallas's bench outscored the Thunder bench 30 to 28. That's key. Again, with the Thunder and how balanced they are, I said, you, your depth, your role players has to step up and help you offset a little bit of what OKC is doing. I haven't even talked about like the, the high scores for OKC here. Shea was brilliant again, 33, 12, and 8, a near triple-double for him on 13 of 24 shooting. Only took three threes. He was one of three, and the one he hit was a pretty big one over Luka. Six of six at the line, so it's not like he lived at the foul line like he did game one, going 11 of 13 there. He also added in two blocks and a steal. Like I Again, I understand people being frustrated, and he had two turnovers, so he did a good job protecting the ball. I understand people being frustrated with the, the whistles he gets. You cannot take anything away from him as a player, man. Like, he is so steady and balanced and smart with what he does. Do I think he's in the same tier as Luka? No, but I think he's one right behind it. Like, if you have that upper, upper echelon, that upper crust, I think Luka is in that territory, in that category there. And then SGA is like the one that's like a half step back behind that. Um, can absolutely play up to and even outperform Luca in a game, especially right now with Luca hampered as he is. But I, I like I like his game. I do understand the the foul thing. It doesn't feel to me as bad as Harden, but maybe that's just a little bit of my uh, my bias, being that the Thunder is sort of a secondary team of mine. I don't watch a lot of their games, but when I do catch it, more often than not, I, I find their team likable and SGA likable. But make no mistake, I'm pulling for the Mavericks here. I've said that enough times already. A big difference in this game, too, is that while J-Dub does give the Thunder 20 points once again, 
He doesn't have that stretch. Game one, he was largely ho-hum until the fourth quarter. He poured in 10 of his 18 points in game one in that fourth quarter. And that was really when OKC just seesawed out in front and pulled away for good against Dallas. And uh, you didn't have that here. In this game, he's 20 points, but he's 7 of 17. And, you know, a lot of those misses coming in the second half were not very close, not very pretty. He looked like he was pressing and forcing, um, just chucking the ball at times at the basket, whether it was against an expiring shot clock or just last minute pressure that made him rush the shot or force the shot, what have you. So Dallas, great job there. Great response. Even though he had more points this game than last, the way in which they contained him served them very well. Uh, Chet Holmgren was uh, very much reduced here. 11, six and six, four of 12 from the field, including one of six from three. He does have two blocks, but Keeping him in check after he was a monster in game one, I thought was huge for Dallas. And Lou Dort also uh, eight and six, eight, six and three for him, three of eight from the field. Gideon, I was actually surprised to find that Giddy, he, he didn't play a lot of minutes. There was a shift here by OKC in which Wiggins, their normal kind of six man here, moved into basically the starting unit. Even though Giddy started, Wiggins played more minutes and was closing with that role. So that makes sense given they needed the firepower and Giddy is not a good three-point shooter. Wiggins is. But getting 20 minutes out of him compared to that, I wonder if that's going to be a strategic role for them moving forward to make that switch with Wiggins coming in at the starting lineup or if they still prefer to have that extra firepower coming off of the bench there. All things to, to take into consideration and keep an eye on. From Kevin Gray on Twitter, he points out that the Mavericks made history last night with Luka and P.J. Washington becoming the first duo in NBA history to each have 25 points, 10 rebounds, and at least five made threes in the same playoff game. We get granular with some of these stats, but I will say, nice, nice. I believe, I believe that runs my course for the talking points I had. So yeah, Dallas gets themselves a mightily needed win in this game, countering OKC, putting the first blemish on their face. And now we head into the interesting picture of game three. Game three is going to be day is game three it's it's middle of the day it's a slightly short turnaround it's another afternoon game which has yet to favor dallas kindly let me see it's game three tomorrow yep game three is saturday afternoon in dallas it is a 2 30 p.m tip off that'll be interesting Afternoon games have yet to favor Dallas kindly, but fingers crossed on this one. If they can respond the way they did in the first round and get another you know, home hold home court, at least in game three, if you can't get a game three and four, then uh, that's going to be huge. But I do worry now. War of attrition is cutting back the other way. First round, I said the Mavericks were the healthier team, even if Luka wasn't 100%, and therefore I felt better about their chances. I feel the opposite here. I feel like Dallas is the walking wounded. And they're winning on grit and determination, whereas OKC is just like, yeah, you got that one, but we're still better positioned for the series as a whole. This is where superstar tandem and coaching are huge. You got one of those, you might be able to do something. You got both, you're in the driver's seat. Kid game-to-game -game adjustments, I feel generally like he's there. Uh, we'll see if he's going to out-coach Dagonal, coach of the year. But uh, if you got Luka and Kyrie doing Luka and Kyrie things, We'll see, man. But let me know in the comments. How do you feel about this game? Are you feeling differently? Is this is this series looking different to you now than it was a couple days ago before we tipped off game one? Like the video, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace!